Good morning uh, and welcome to the Puerto Rican and Latino Studies West Side Story, <clears throat> the Brooklyn Connection Lecture Series. Welcome, bienvenidos, bienvenidas, bienvenides. The session is being recorded. Please take note of that. Um, and uh, I would like to introduce myself at this point. I am Dr. Maria Perez y Gonzalez. I am an associate professor in the Department of Puerto Rican and Latino Studies here at Brooklyn College and deputy chairperson. Uh, among us today is our chairperson, Dr. Alan Aja, and of course, the class that this special series centers around, uh, Pearls 2105. So uh, we welcome you all. Let me begin, begin by saying that we acknowledge that this is the unceded territory of the Lenape indigenous peoples. We need to learn about and commit ourselves to beginning the process of dismantling ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and to recognize the hundreds of indigenous nations who continue to resist, live, and uphold their sacred relations across their lands. May we remember to uplift and honor indigenous ancestors each and every day. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to acknowledge also uh, Ms. Matilda Nistal, who designed my virtual background, and the beautiful posters, flyers uh, that we've seen. So uh, thank you, Matilda. This department of pearls, uh, Puerto Rican and Latino Studies, the course is offered as part of the Intercultural Competency Rubric in General Education at Brooklyn College. The focus is West Side Story, uh, The Brooklyn Connection, which I am teaching with the centerpiece being the lecture series, which Dr. Virginia Sanchez Coral made possible. This course centers the 10-time Academy Award-winning film in 1961 as connected to the forthcoming December 2021, uh, being released next Monday, of the version produced by Steven Spielberg, Tony Kushner, Christy Makosko Krieger, Kevin McConnell, and Rita Moreno. Our course explores the artistic and cultural impact of West Side Story through the lenses of the humanities and social sciences, highlighting topics of Puerto Rico's history with the United States of America, immigration, ethno-racial relations, gender, gangs, language, music, character analysis, and the like. Professor Emerita of Pearls and recipient of the 2020 Herbert H. Lehman Prize for Distinguished Service in New York History, Dr. Virginia Sanchez Coral, served as historical consultant to West Side Story 2021, and she is the Brooklyn College Connection. She's also a Brooklyn College alum. Together, we've organized a lecture series of special guests connected with the film to share their experience uh, their expertise and insight for students as they move through the socio-historic background and artistry of West Side Story. She is my co-host and chaired the Department of Puerto Rican and Latino Studies from 1989 to 2004 and was founding president of the Puerto Rican Studies Association. Her numerous publications include From Colonia to Community, The History of Puerto Ricans in New York, and the three-volume Latinas in the United States, a historical encyclopedia. Her forthcoming 2021 co-edited book, set to be out any moment now, which we partnered together to produce, is entitled Puerto Rican Studies in the City University of New York. Uh, and I'd like to share briefly just um, the cover of that because we are so we find it so beautiful. So there is uh, the book that we are co-editing, <clears throat> and it has many writers, uh, seasoned writers, up and coming, you know, scholars, um, and students of Puerto Rican studies from the past. Uh, so we, I will have now um, the the pleasure of introducing um, Maestra. Janine Tesori. Um, thank you for your uh, generous time that you're donating uh, and for sharing your expertise with us. Um, and so let me begin with a short bio and then I will have the pleasure of playing for you another uh, song 
um, uh, about Miss Tesori. Uh, Maestra Janine Tesori is a composer of musical theater, opera, television, and film. She won the Tony Award for Best Score with book writer and lyricist Lisa Cron for the musical Fun Home. Her other musicals include Caroline or Change with Tony Kushner, and we're going to see part of that later. Uh, and it's on Broadway right now. Shrek the Musical with David Lindsay Abair. Thoroughly Modern Millie with Dick Scanlon. Violet with Brian Crawley. And Soft Power with David Henry Huang, which was her second work after Fun Home to be a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Drama. Along with Missy Mazzoli, she is one of the first women to be commissioned by the Metropolitan Opera. Her latest opera, Blue, Libretto by Tazewell Thompson, received the Music Critics Association of North America Award for Best New Opera. Her music film credits include The Little Mermaid, Ariel's Beginnings, Mulan 2, Lilo and Stitch 2, and many more. So she does many, many serious works as well as many others that are very serious for the younger generations. In addition to her work as a composer, Tesori is the founding artistic director of New York City Center's Encores Off-Center series. She's a lecturer in music at Yale University and the supervising vocal producer of Steven Spielberg's West Side Story. A history maker, Tesori was cited by the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers as being the first female composer to have two original musicals, Thoroughly Modern Millie and Caroline or Change, running concurrently on Broadway. And she is the most prolific and honored female theatrical composer in the United States. And so at this point, I'd like to welcome Maestra Janine Tesori, and I will be playing um, a trailer for Carolina Change. It's on Broadway right now. Nothing ever happened underground in Louisiana Cause they ain't no underground in Louisiana Tough and dreary and all disheveled Sixteen feet below sea level Baby, oh, baby. gonna drown Gonna drown all, all day, day long You with a frown I see you frown oh, Dressed in white I'm feeling low Talking to the washer and the radio That's tremendous. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. It's a wonderful cast. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so, so Dr. Virginia sanchez Cochran. Well, this is, I, I'm just delighted that you're here. I Can I call you Janine and not of my Of course. Estate? Okay, you can call me Virginia, not Professor. <laughs> so, um, how, it, it, Caroline, you know my favorite song from Caroline, which is really interesting because I hadn't thought about it until last night, is, is Rose's song. Because Rose is such a fish out of water. And she and and she 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 comes from she misses the up uh, the upper west side and she comes from Brooklyn and she's Jewish and she's been transplanted to the South. She is she is the other in yeah. the South. She is the other. 
And, uh, and, and when you hear that plaintive song uh, where her family doesn't, isn't even responding to her, um, that was just so brilliant. And when I saw the play, I kind of, okay, that's there, but I didn't really think about it. And, uh, and one of the nice things about today is that I've been thinking about all, all the music. How do, you, how, do you, how do you prepare yourself to inhabit these different cultures that you end up writing so brilliantly about? Um, well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I'm, I'm as you know, a yeah. <clears throat> huge fan of, um, of this program and the way that yeah. it delves and asks questions because I feel like that's how we move forward mm -hmm. is through dialogue. You know, I think the proclamations are one thing, but I think the dialogue where we, we get to bounce off each other is, is mm -hmm. the most important thing. You know, for, for me, it's all about partnership. Um, Steve Sontimes, who just passed away very recently and was a very dear friend, uh, he always talked about how making work is experience, observation, imagination, those three. So I think you bring your imagination to something that you can't possibly have experienced because we cannot walk in the shoes or the heels, the platforms, the ballet slippers, mm -hmm. the sandals of, of other people all the time. It's not simply not possible. So that's the magic and the mystery that you bring, but you must partner with someone who has been there, has this lived experience. I think that's the point. So it enriches your life and then you bring your craft to it. Uh, and uh, so for me, I make sure that with the, um, the idea of saying yes to a project really depends on who I'm partnering with. And then once we start there, like Taswell Thompson, when we did Blue, Blue of course is his story deeply and um, his story and history, that's, there's no accident that those words when you say them quickly are the same words. So he would say the libretto to me over and over so I could hear his emphasis and I could hear the timbre of his voice and where it changed. And we talked about his experience on the earth um, as a, a queer man, uh, a black queer man in New York City endlessly to the point where I understand it at a, a level so that I can, I feel like I am ready to illuminate something without having had that experience myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really amazing. Uh, how did you come to, to do what you do? Uh, you know, we, we, we talk about uh, exposing our students to, uh, uh, to, to knowledge through books, which is, which is legitimate, it's fine. But uh, we seldom get a chance to meet people who are actually doing the things that create uh, our, our American culture, our society. And it, it, I just sit back in, in, in awe of all you've accomplished, but I know there must have been a time when you weren't doing that. How did you come about to, to, to carve a career the way you have at such a young age? Yeah. Uh, well, I, part, you know, I think the, a big part of it for me, and when I teach, I always talk about ancestral pull on the legacy of our, not only our culture, but our family's tradition. And we spend a lot of time with students, you know, understanding where our, what, uh, what the, the, the tuning of our culture is, the songs of our cultures, our respective cultures that we bring into the room. My grandfather was a composer in Sicily and he came over here um, to pursue music and uh, was not successful and died very young pumping gas. And I feel that pull in me, I feel like there's an urgency in, in me because I feel like I'm pulling the sleigh in a way for two and for my grandmother and uh, who also didn't live to see my career in music. So I think that's part, partially, it's just on a cellular level. I just feel it and can't quite describe it. I, I just mm -hmm. feel it. And then there, I think there's the other part where, you know, I think that people don't really talk about when you have no connections to the theater or to music. I landed here at 17 without, um, the greatest thing that my father gave me was to graduate without debt. And that was an incredible, I had a hundred dollars and that was it. And the ability to play the piano. And that was simply it. 
So, but it was a, a big deal. And then I just said yes to many, many things and found myself saying yes to things that I felt stretched through the growing edge. I did not plan at all to become a composer. That was not in the plan. I'm sorry, my dog is taking my cable. Um, so I think, you know, it was just a matter of saying, well, no one in the room can write music. Well, let me give it a go. Let me, let me try, I think I can do it. And then it just seemed to flow naturally. And then I had to back it up with technique. So it took me a very long time. I still feel like I'm catching up in the mastery of, of craft. The, the rest of it, I feel like I have the, the pull and the desire and, and the ability to stay with something and the, the joy. I've accepted the loneliness of writing about staying in a room for 12 hours, which you have to have as a writer. Um, you know, I lived in a lighthouse by myself for a year to sort of train that way and very early on. And so I've accepted all of that, but the craft is something that I feel like I'm consistently, I feel always a little step behind. I can, I can relate to that. I think most people who go into writing or, uh, you know, and, uh, any craft, any, anything that you go into, uh, I, can, I can relate to that, but I'm, I'm, I really like the idea that, that there's a cellular um, propulsion that you don't really understand, but it's sort of like it's up to you now to, to carry it forth. I don't know what it is that you're carrying forth, but whatever it is, it's something that you're, it's part of the legacy. Oh, and so I, I like that very much. Um, uh, I, I feel that, that I want to cover everything, but I know that Maria also has some questions. But before I give it to Maria, one question. <laughs> what did you, how, how did you get involved with West Side Story? Uh, so many, you know, so many of the people who are involved with that particular movie, it was a, like a first time experience, but you, your name alone being there was, was a fantastic pull for many. How did you get, how did you get involved with West Side Story? What did you do? Two words, Tony Kushner. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I have made it my life's work to try to understand uh, musicals for me are from the divine. I think musical, uh, uh, musical dramas are so incredible. Uh, what they can do is limitless. They come out of a, in this country, they come out of operetta and vaudeville. And so out of those strains and through the deliciousness of going through people's experience and what they do to move the art form forward, that is really happening right now. Um, I folded in at the age of 18 or 19. I knew nothing about drama except that I grew up in an Italian household. So I learned firsthand, the most dramatic thing in an Italian household is called dinner. <laughs> and, you know, the, that idea of the epic nature of, uh, you know, the Sicilian, particularly Southern Italian um, the folk culture is filled with uh, drama. The, looking back when you look at Greek myths, you know, and you look at uh, all of the myths where we all started from, they all have what, what you, what's contained in the human experience. So that for me was a, a really big pull. And as I've written more and more, I've gotten very interested in what I come to see as the tuning of the world, of that everybody has a song that's happening internally. We are really, um, I think, unwise to ignore the internal tuning of our humanity. Everyone has a song to sing. It is our job to locate it, to amplify it, to push the faders up, and to make sure those who have not claimed the space get listened to. Will it be perfect? Never. Will there be a purity about it? Almost never. But we must strive to do more, to reveal that inner working. I, I agree. I, I think um, I, I would say on a cellular level, it exists in all of us, just like the Overtone series, which scientifically exists in our humanity. It is in us. So on that end, my job, I think, on this, that I got through Tony Kushner, who said, would you be interested in talking to um, Stephen and Christy about doing this, was to come in with the POV of a composer, since we didn't have the composer anymore. Right. 
Exactly. And, and to really not look at it as a story that has been done, but that a story that is sung into being, a story that is really inhabited by characters who want something and there's something in the way of them wanting it and they work lyrically to work through these songs as opposed to I'm singing West Side Story it's so famous and it's complicated it's like you're not singing West Side Story you're singing and you're not singing you're actually working something out inside that we happen to the audiences will eavesdrop on that's a very different point of view going from the inside out as opposed to having the, oh, I must obey this music. It's like, don't obey music. We, our job is to render writers, in a sense, invisible because they are trying to capture life. So that's, that's what I, that's my philosophy going in. And I learned it. I also am very interested in movie musicals and being part of them because I, I'm interested in that form and, um, and, and working more in that field. But we had such a young cast also. Yeah that came almost with a, you know, the, the blank slate. Uh, how did you infuse this theory, your ideas, into their, in, into working with them? Uh, they had such a small amount of experience to, to go on. Uh, so how did you work with them? What did you do you know with them? This is what I'm finding with young people. Yeah. We did, I've been part of a program called The Broader Way, which has yeah. been, um, I, I'm not part of anymore except on an ancillary way, which worked from young women for, uh, to put them to understand and cultivate leadership that's within from 10 to 18. And the thing that I've always been interested about young people is their inherent wisdom. So they come on to, you know, our baby John is 14, Maria was 16, 17, and now um, 18 years old, I think maybe 19 now, it's been so long. Uh, and to see what they think, wh where they are, which I'm very interested in because that's, that's gonna be what they bring. So when I was talking to Rachel about I Feel Pretty, when we talk about whiteness, about being the source of beauty in this country, and, and she is singing, I feel pretty. Um, one of the things that was very interesting to me is if I feel pretty was not blah, 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 blah. It's not something you obey, but you discover in, in surrounded by whiteness for a, a young woman of color uh, to feel that. And the way that, that I won't, in the spoilers, the way that it's set in the movie is quite extraordinary. And it's a very Shakespearean way uh, you know that something mm -hmm. terrible has happened and you visit with other characters who have no knowledge of this terrible thing. So the audience has a secret. They know that tragedy has happened, but in another part of the world, there are people celebrating because they don't know yet. They, they don't know what the audience knows, which is my favorite mm -hmm. kind of tension. So what would it be like to discover this feeling in a, in a, you know, surrounded by white women who define beauty? Would it be like to say, I feel pretty? And it goes by like that, but it stands for a big, big idea. So that's the kind of work and the architecture of the music and what these, uh, what the creative team might have been after that we guess and we read and we ask about. And that part is the fun. Mm -hmm. It is, it is an important, it is very, very important when you, when you phrase it like that, because uh, for people who are marginalized or who have had their history erased, uh, as uh, many of us have, uh, the idea of feeling pretty in and of yourself uh, and not trying to become the, the white mannequins, you know, the, uh, is, 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 is a revelation. Uh, but um, um, I'm, I'm sorry to say we do not take the time to analyze and to see what is actually happening in, in, in the film, to begin to understand that in light of the communities that it represents. And I I'm, I'm thank you for, for putting it the way that you did because it, it makes a, a big difference. I, I see Maria's getting nervous over there. So 
<laughs> I, okay. I, I don't want the moment to pass. And then, to, so Tony Kushner invited you to be part of this. And so, uh, you know, for, for, for those of us who are here and, and you're a musical composer, a musical arranger, a conductor, a vocalist. So, I mean, the music is for West Side Story is set. So explain to us, right, who have no clue um, what you've done, right, in terms of this film. What is your role? How did you actually, what did you actually do? Um, and how did you feel about undertaking that, right, from Maestro Leonard Bernstein uh, and having to put this forward uh, in this film? So how did... <laughs> so That's how I felt about it. it. I mean, you know, the pressure is real. The pr I, I feel um, always so, I feel so nervous about everything, honestly. I, I think it's why I'm not on social media at all. We were talking about that before because I am, I want to work. I want to, I was just talking with my mom who's um, about to turn 91. We were talking about the way that we wanted to leave the world. Um, you know, because we don't talk about that either. We're we're not here for a long time in the course of things, and I feel like it is so important to really look at what you can add. Life should be additive. It's not about this perfectionism that I think is rampant right now, which I also suffer from. There is this idea that really being humble. And, and also having a great sort of hubris to say, what am I going to bring to this work before I say yes? Otherwise it should be a big fat no. And I really felt like what I could bring to the work is an incredible love of this music and the orchestrations. My, what I was trained by my mentors was to think of music as a treasure map. What's here? What, what is there available for you? And then you, pretend that you never learned it and you inhabit it. And so that is a technique that I use with uh, students in, in that way when we talk about um, creating work into being. So you're not singing the work of Bernstein, you are expressing the feelings of a character based on Romeo and Juliet from so long ago that is really about how the world needs to divide itself into, you look at mitosis on a cellular level, there is some need that we have it, you know, to divide and look at ourselves, however it, it works. And the way that we have defined this is inside America is shifting. This work that was done in 57 is a representative of a certain time and in that context. And then when we present it now, what are we going to do with it? So it remains inside the conversation, imperfectly expressed, but still expressed. So that I feel like it's working on all pistons of with your heart and your ability to look at the expression musically, dramatically, and then really talk about what, what their lives are like when they walk out that door. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. The 1961 West Side Story, um, all four of the, the main four characters, the singing was dubbed, right? The, what are they called? Um, ghost singers for Maria, for Tony, for Riff and Anita. Um, and so tell us about this one. <laughs> this and, one is not dubbed. <laughs> <laughs> no and one is dubbed. dubbed. Yeah, and how, how did that turn itself out? How did that work? Including, and I don't think I'm giving any spoilers because this is already out there in an interview, right? Uh, you had to work with Rita Moreno on yeah. the singing part that, that was not in the original. So um, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that, about, you know, um, why did they use them in the beginning, you know, for the original? Because, you know, you can't really tell that it is. And then I was looking at this film and saying, hmm, let me see if I can see <laughs> whether it was dubbed in this one. <laughs> Well, again, I think it, in context, there, is a, there was a kind of practice um, that, you know, look at Audrey Hepburn in My Fair Lady, and uh, it was very common that, that you, you, you did that, that you dubbed someone else's voice. Marty Nixon did a tremendous amount of work in that, um, and now it's just not a practice. It, I think that there is a, a, a beauty to the human voice that is absolutely linked to how people look with their eyes when they sing something. I, I, you know, and this all comes from Stephen and Tony. 
that they have this deep relationship to this music and this musical. All of these ideas were embedded into the script that they worked on for many, many, many months by the time that I folded in. And, and again, it's looking at each theater. A theater job is, some, I, my, my, my kids laugh at this, but it is like a dog with a backpack. A dog with a backpack has a job to do. That's how you sometimes can train a dog is it has to feel like it has purpose. So you put a little backpack on it and it brings stuff and it feels like a theater song has a job to do. It's either about telling you what your identity is, your ensemble identity, like when you're a jet, or it's deepening the emotional understanding or it's moving the narrative <clears throat> forward. It has a job to do to propel. Otherwise it's a concert. A concert is a sequence of events. You go to a concert and people have it on the neck of their guitars. I'm gonna play this and then this and then this, a sequence. But a musical, an opera, a dramatic work has a purpose that it brings you from A to B and then B to K. And then at the end, um, it, the whole thing stands up like this because it has caused the next thing to happen. And that is the fun of trying to think like, what, you know, what is happening here? And then, and that's even before you start learning notes. And then I, I do something where I really look at text without music and we look at what, how you might say it, say it, speak it, speak it, speak it, speak it, follow the thought, follow the thought. Now follow the thought against the musical phrase. If the phrase is broken in two, but the thought goes over four, you're gonna to have to carry that thought over that whole long phrase, even through the rest, which music is playing, even though you can't hear it. So this kind of work is boring and takes a long time, but in the end, it really pays off, I think, because it is subtle. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, reminds me then of Caroline and and uh, particularly, you know, her 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 last number where she explains to the world who she is and why she's why she's down in the basement. And it all, all of her entire life is tied up in that one song and uh, and, and, and you were able to bring that to, to, to an audience. And I thought that that was really spectacular. Caroline is a particularly important character in that sense of uh, her, her personality is, you know, you, 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 no, you assume what has happened to her, but you really don't know it until she tells you. And she tells you, she sings with her body. She sings with her with her hands. She sings with, it's 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 an encompassing moment, uh, to and it sort of gathers together all of the theories that that you've been explaining. Um, so that's particularly good. Uh, how did you how did you um, in in West Side Story? I think that the most striking of all to me is uh, is uh, is Rita singing somewhere. Uh, you were able to put so much emotion into that song with her singing because she has a backstory. Uh, because you know that she's gone through it, it just in that moment. You on you begin and she looks at the picture of Doc. And you kind of understand. Wow, I, this woman hasn't had it easy. Uh, so I'm 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 really glad that you you're able to you know share uh, that perspective. So. Uh, I don't have another question, Maria. <laughs> yes. Um, so okay. part of the, right, well, um, Kene Ongwug, forgive me, Kene Ongwug Bolu is asking, and, and this was along the lines of what I was thinking as well, um, they state, love the new soundtrack and how faithful it is to the 1957 stage show. Thank um, you. So, so I want you to explain, to, I never saw the 1957 stage show. Um, can you explain to us, um, and I've seen some of the interviews and it does say that, you know, this film goes back to the order of the original 1957 stage mm -hmm. production. So can you take us through that? Um, I'm, I love music, but you know, I don't know the ins and outs of this and what can you tell us about uh, its faithfulness to the 1957 and, and what's so, um, you know, uh, why are people sort of ooing and eyeing over that? So if you can just uh, take us through that. 
Well, it, it has to be said that, that a lot of these ideas come, come from Tony and Steven. So by the time I folded in, these structural ideas were, were there. So they're really not mine to, I wanna be very careful to not claim something that wasn't mine. Um, I, I think what was mine was this, this uh, uh, every, every song when I would meet with the artists, we would say like, why? You start with why. Why are you singing? There is a lot of people in musical say you sing when you can't speak anymore. That makes my third eyelid go up. I don't even know what that means. I don't because I, I operate <laughs> from my gut, right? You, you sing because you sing. And I think there is a lifting off that songs start, you know, the jet song doesn't start when um, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, that thing happens. It starts with a rhythm way before. So if they can understand where a song starts, but the audience doesn't hear it, they don't have to do a lot of heavy lifting. They can understand the shoulders they're standing on inside the narrative. So this is the, the thing that we talk about and the order that we worked with has to be inevitable. George Seawolf always talks about this musicals being built on rhythm and inevitability. Rhythm in that something like where something happens after a great amount of tension, like I feel pretty, the rhythm of that, or where cool is placed, or where Krupke is, where it's releasing the tension of a moment. Krupke is really about dramatizing the system in which these young men are going to become young thugs, which are going to become young, like the, the outcasts of society, which is laid out. How does that happen? Well, it happens because there's a system in place. So in hands that are not really examining Krupke, you can go with the rhythm that's already there, this beer hall rhythm. Dun, 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 da, 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 da. Well, your ear is delighted by that. So we have to make sure people still listen to the story that's being said. Okay, go here. Oh, you don't want him? Go here. Oh, you don't want him? Just make sure he passes and spit them out into the world. Oh, you don't want him? Okay, well, what happens to these people? Well, they get spit out somewhere in, in the kerplunk game, right? The gumball falls somewhere. That's to me what that song is about. We had to make sure that people got both. So this the incredible staging of that number and the way that we started it was to make sure that people understand people are not born this way. You know, that's not what kids have this ability to come out into the world and want to be part of a system that is beyond their control. And then dun, 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 and then it happens and at the end. So that is the potential of the impact to have a duality in the listening, the enjoyment and the entertainment. And on this way, the learning, the deep learning about how systems in this country work. And uh, to follow up on that, um, they ask, besides America, the America song, were there any other songs that were looked at for potentially updating its lyrics? Because the America song right in 1957 was, um, and, and uh, yesterday's ABC 2020 ABC special, mm -hmm. Uh, Rita Morena spoke about when she first was doing the 1961 film that she almost said no to the role of Anita precisely because, right, the America song um, talks derogatorily, right, uh, negatively about Puerto Rico. And so when she finally got the script, it was rewritten, right? So the lyrics were changed so it didn't say all of that about Puerto Rico. Um, and so she could stomach it, right? So she could accept the part and she could do what she had to do. Um, so the question is, were there any other songs that were looked at for potentially updating its lyrics? We, we looked at everything. And, and the funny thing was that Steve Sondheim was famously, like, I produced uh, the Sunday in the Park with George that we did on Broadway mm -hmm. after City Center because I worked with Jake Gyllenhaal a lot. And when we did that recording, it was amazing how he started listening to the lyrics and questioning some. And I was like, what? But he was listening as if the words were in oil paint and could be moved around. He did that for all of West Side Story, questioning everything to the point where I thought, oh my God, it's really good. Don't change it. The things that needed to change, he and Tony, because they were both working with text, right. would work very closely. I think there was one word in one hand, one heart. Um, but everything else, uh, to my knowledge, is exactly, we treat the music little 
differently. So you hear the lyrics differently, but the lyrics are the same. Okay. You know, I, I have a point also about the, the music. Uh, a lot of people have been uh, asking why we, why La Borinquena is included, which is the only other song that is not part of the, in any way of, uh, of West Side Story. And uh, when I was brought in uh, also through Tony to read the script, uh, and I came to that part where uh, Bernardo's singing La Borinquena, I went, oh, wow. Oh, this is really bold. Uh, I, I love it. This is fantastic. This is great. But what is it doing there? How does it fit there? Why does that kid know that? I didn't know that when I was growing up on the streets of New York, you know, I didn't know that in 1957. Uh, and so we, uh, how does he know it? Uh, what's happening? And we had to, I stopped Tony at that moment. And I said, uh, tell me why he's doing that. Because I don't believe it. It doesn't come naturally. It's not organic. It doesn't just, it, it, there's, there's, why is it there? And we began to discuss the reasons why it's there and the reasons why the characters are who they are. And, uh, and, 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 and of course, as looking at the history, it makes perfectly good sense. It makes absolutely good sense because these are the issues that are going on in the Puerto Rican New York community during that time. Why wouldn't they know it? Uh, it was it was out there for them to know it, and any group that is feeling oppressed would would naturally be drawn to something as revolutionary as it, uh, as it, I it agree. Just, it works. It works. It, 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 I and, feel like it is necessary though because there is yeah. something the the original and what Tony did there I, as a dramatist. Mm -hmm. There is the first time that you hear anything sung in this is Bor Kenya. And mm -hmm. when we went down to Puerto Rico and when I asked, I um, you know, some friends who are from Puerto Rico and then moved here. Right. Um, and I recorded everybody singing their version of the Bor Kenya on my iPhone. I just went around and, and back there. And when we went in the studio and we were recording that, um, it was not only that Victor Cruz, who of course worked on the movie with us, um, and this, that wonderful professor from the University of Puerto Rico who we worked with, because mm -hmm. of course I don't have an experience with that, but I recorded, I did a session where the singers inside, we recorded their history with that anthem, how they remember learning it, where they were, look on their father's faces when they, the, the, like, and you just heard it. Why would the Jet songs sing the Jet songs? So I think this is where imagination and the idea of why does anybody sing anything? It's identity. The jet song sings the identity so that they redouble the stakes and the right. idea that if they stick together. And for me, the anthem was so incredibly important to start the movie on this level ground that I, a song of identity was going to be matched with another song of ensemble identity. Mm -hmm. And it was incredibly important, as important as when those, you see those sharks, they're dressed in, they all have jobs. They're, none of those jets have, to my knowledge, have a job. None of and, them, you don't see them in a uniform or of a barber or no. studying or in school, none of them. So there is a shift inside yeah. what is also happening that I think is so incredibly important in this film. As important as, as I feel pretty for a Puerto Rican woman at that time. Uh, so I think that those are ex exceptionally good points. Uh, and, uh, you know, I find myself going into the history of it more and more because uh, uh, pe uh, people today don't understand the reality of 1957 for the Puerto Rican community in New York City and, uh, and what we were going through. I know Bobby Sanabria brought out a great deal of information about that because uh, both of us were, you know, New York grown. Uh, and, um, and, and, and it's interesting because that, that the, the film, the music of the film works on so many different levels uh, that if, if people would listen to it, they would understand uh, where this is coming from. So I'm very glad about that. 
Well, and, and La Borinquena, yeah. is, it surprised me, right? I did see it last week yeah. at the premiere. It did surprise me. And I was just like, huh? And then I was just like, by the end of it, yes, right? Yes. It's a defiant yeah. song. Uh, La Borinquena, you know, for those who don't know, is the national anthem of Puerto Rico. Um, there is the traditional version that is often sung. And then there's a revolutionary version. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the revolutionary one that appears uh, right. in this in this uh, new West Side Story film. Yeah. And so it's 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 dynamic also because it's more than just sort of telling the Jets, right? Um, I'm here to stay, right? I'm I'm defying you. It's also against the backdrop of gentrification, mm -hmm. right? And so the issue of gentrification in the film comes to the fore. Mm -hmm. Um, because the Jets and the Sharks, right, are experiencing gentrification of their neighborhood. Uh, and so uh, you see the Puerto Ricans, you know, sort of protesting, right, with the signs saying about gentrification and all of that, um, and seeing how um, the dilapidated buildings, right, being um, the wrecking ball, right, and, and all that disaster. So you see that. Um, and so the song comes in the midst of that. So it's not just about standing up to the shark, um, to the jets, right? It's the sharks, the Puerto Ricans standing up to, you know, trying to stand up anyway, resisting the powers that be that are trying to take over the neighborhood and, and the system, as you say. So that's, that's really, um, so by the end of that, I was just like, yes. And, and they do it with such conviction, you know, especially the, the main singer, um, uh, David uh, Bernardo. Right. Um, that it's, it's, it's convincing on that end because that definitely is not there. So, uh, you know, you know, that when, 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 uh, when, uh, uh, Ramon Betances asked Lola Rodriguez de Tio to write that song, uh, he said to her that, and this was in 1868 and, 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 uh, just before El Grito de Lares, uh, he says to her, write me a tune that will get them up on their feet and out the door. And she does that. She does exactly that. She writes, she writes the song that will inspire them to fight for their independence from Spain back in the 19th century. And then the song is outlawed for that. The words are outlawed for, for, for years. And uh, it really, looking at both the, the jets and, and the sharks, you know, I, I, I started to wonder, uh, a gentrification, urban renewal, which 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 I certainly lived through. Um, what would have happened if the Jets and the Sharks had gotten together? They would have won. They would have won the battle. They would not have destroyed the neighborhood if they had gotten together. Well, that's yeah. drama. That's you, drama. Oh, and you, I, you really do. You bring up a really yeah. great point. Is one of yeah. the things that we say is why is this here? And what yeah. would happen if it wasn't here? Right. So you you question a presence by by also accepting its absence. When we mm -hmm. were filming that, the people in the extras who were in the background, everybody started singing. That was not planned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One That's of it. our attendees. Oh, I'm sorry, Virginia. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say one of our attendees put in the chat uh, a question. Uh, you did mention Victor Cruz, and we had Victor Cruz as part of our uh, special guest uh, lecturers, as well as Tony Kushner that you had mentioned in your testimony. And And Tita, we had Tita. Tita came with Victor. Yeah. Uh, did you have um, Edgar? Edgar wasn't on. No. 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 Uh, so no. Natalie Guevara asks, did you collaborate with the Puerto Rican dialect coaches like Victor Cruz? on the Latinx actor's vocals to ensure a natural transition from speaking to singing. I absolutely love the nuances on a boy like that, have a love, <laughs> and America in particular. Yeah. I couldn't help it, I had to sort of sing that. I might cry, <laughs> I might cry. Because I, I cannot tell you, you know, for me, first of all, making a living as a composer, if anyone is out there wanting to do it, I wish you well, and and it's so hard. It's so hard, and I'm old, and it's hard, because if you really stand by what you want to write, and I, you know, there are a couple of things I wrote so that I could put my kid through school, but mostly what I write is not about it's not about the money. You can tell, it's really about taking these stories that I want to see, and and the thing that I've always questioned about movie musicals is why is there this bump? Why, why do they speak a certain way and then they sing a certain way? 
And so Victor and Tom and I, when we were talking about dialect, I wanted to understand about dialect that it's not just one dialect. If your family has been here, like my Sicilian grandmother, right. she was here years and she still had the, an accent that you could barely get through. My other set of barely an accent. Why is that? Why do dialects change? Why do they soften? Where, where, do, how do they get sandpapered by time? Why in tonight, why is it not use? Why is that sound not been how they speak, how we carry over the way that the T's are? Tell me about how that works. My ears were so big because I felt like it was so incredibly moving to me. Dialect growing up, I, I, you know, just in Italian, the Sicilian dialect is really mushy and the Northern is not. And us uh, Southern Italians have been looked down on our whole lives. Capiche, right? Mushy, mushy. And so I see that dialect is very, like is part of the storytelling. And I needed to understand these characters because it also would tell me the length of time. You now there's some people who have been in the States for many years and they have no mm -hmm. accent at all or they have a little bit. So that to me makes me so happy to hear that it's, it, was, it was communicated because it was really important. And, 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 and communicated by Ari, who, who, who uh, you know, confesses that she is not that fluent in, in Spanish to be able to, to capture that and to bring that in was, was, was very important to her. Oh, she was, they were all in. They were yeah. all, all, yeah. all in. One other question. We have uh, Mr. Damon Evans uh, with us. He's been on Broadway. He was part of the Jeffersons. Uh, so he was a professional actor way back when, and uh, he did graduate from Brooklyn College uh, recently. Um, he has a question. Uh, he says, uh, I understand that Spanish dialogue has been added without any subtitles in the new film. This was done on Broadway in a recent revival with Spanish lyrics by Lin-Manuel Miranda, yet it proved um, unsuccessful, right? That they had to revert back to English. Why did Spielberg decide to use Spanish dialogue in this film version? I'm not sure you have the answer, but perhaps you, <laughs> you might. Well, there are no, to my nods, beside the board in Kenya, there are no Spanish lyrics. Right. Um, the, uh, the, I, and I believe the Antonio and Stephen will know more, but it was something right from the beginning. This is a country that is not monolingual. This is, uh, the, this is a, a, a bilingual country and there should not, the, I think the acknowledgement of that um, and the feeling of not understanding, but you do understand. I, I feel like, you know, I didn't understand the Spanish, but I did understand. I think it's incredibly important. Mm -hmm. My daughter is fluent in sign language. And when I watch her, it's not performative, it's communication. And it also, for me, is the idea of that's what it's like to be outside. That's what it feels like to be outside the understanding when someone is speaking in a language that you don't understand. Your tension goes up, your ears go up, you, tr you lean in. What are they saying? What can I look at? The body language, the way that they gesture so that I can try to understand. I thought it was incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And Janine, you, you, did you grow up in a household where both languages were spoken? Uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's sort of sort of like Spanglish today. I mean, it, I grew up in a household where we spoke Spanish at home, and and as I got older and became more English dominant, because Spanish yeah. was my first language, as I became more English dominant, I would I would begin to speak to my parents in English, and they would answer me in Spanish. Uh, it, that's a normal thing. That's authenticity. Yes, and, and that's exactly and, right. That's and exactly that was right. that was what we were striving for was authenticity. This is how it happens. This is what it looks like. Uh, so it's also yes. not for your it's not for your yeah. ears. I think the point you bring up, like I have such a memory. My grandmother was a seamstress, and I have such I mean backbreaking work. Right, those old mm -hmm. machines where you go boop 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 boop, and I remember her little crazy. Her feet didn't fit in shoes anymore, so they look like you know the of the um the seven dwarves when their feet just become one toe and they only come with <laughs> slippers. You know, our nonas they they become yeah. boop 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 yeah. speaking speaking to her Italian friend who was also a seamstress. Those were not for my ears. 
I could just, I could hear the rhythm and the music of the language. Mm -hmm. That was a conversation for two people. It wasn't for me. And I think that's exactly right. That's what happens in a household. And, and the conversation in the film is for the Spanish speaking audience. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be explained. It can, you can, you know the meaning because you get the meaning, but it doesn't, it's, it's a private conversation. They're not outsiders. They're, they're insiders there. Exactly. They, they're in control. And yes, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, that surprised me in the film. Um, but as I told, I tell my students, right, when we study uh, sort of bilingual playwrights, right, they do write some in Spanish, um, but it's okay. I tell them, don't worry. If you don't understand it, you can't read it. It's okay because the rest of it, you can get the context because that's the way that Latinxes tend to speak. Um, and, you know, being Puerto Rican myself, when, when I do say something in Spanish, I tend to repeat it, or at least there's something, you know, along the lines when you can definitely know what's going on. And I think the film does that. So, and I think it does it quite well, but I was surprised. I was like, wait a minute, this is, there's a lot of Spanish here and no subtitles. Hmm, something new, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I think there's such a large, right? There's such a large Latinx community in this United States um, that absolutely, and, and so many um, children are learning Spanish, right? Where, um, that are not that where Spanish is not their ancestral heritage language, you know, they're learning Spanish, whether in school or as little toddlers, right? They're, uh, they're dual language schools, bilingual, there's all these kinds of, right? Spanish is, is a prominent language. So I think it, I think it works. And I think the risk was worth taking. Um, I think I, I thought it was very nice. I thought it was, it's a welcoming experience, right? And La Borinquena, the song is the only Spanish language song in the film as well. And while again, you don't really know what they're saying, if you don't understand Spanish, you know the sentiment, you can see the dynamics and you see what's going on. You know, the Born Kenya is one of the greatest anthems of all time. Look at our, mm -hmm. our, our anthem. I, I, the, I mean, first of all, who can sing it? And as Tony Kushner famously wrote, the highest note, like freedom is, is too hard. It's so far away and so high, you can't get it. This anthem is modal. Da ba 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 bum bum ba 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 da 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 dum ba 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 da bum ba da 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 dum, and then it goes major, and you just you just know the way that it's carved out that you it ignites its catalyst. It's it's something to say. Rise up, rise up. I I just love it. I fell in absolutely in love with it. What would you say, by means of advice, you began, you, you said it, you mentioned it a few minutes ago, you know, for those uh, of us, you know, who are, um, not me, but, you know, for those of us in the audience who are aspiring to, to write music, to be a vocalist, a musical arranger, what is your best advice for them? How, how do they, you said you came, you, you weren't connected, right? So, so how yeah. did that happen? Uh, and I know that you have some programs where you, you mentioned before that you do help some younger people, right, in, in the music yeah. industry. Um, can you, you know, for those of us, especially people of color, right, Latinxes, who um, are trying to make it, trying to, trying to be in the Broadway business, we love it, we love the music, but, you know, if, we're, if we have talents and gifts and are studying this, how do, how do we get through? Because the connection part, Right, pala in Spanish we say, but then el padrino is uh, like yeah, you, you need sort of a godfather in the business to, to help you in a mentor, right? So how, if you don't have that, what do you do? I I didn't meet my mentor until I was twenty four. So uh, when I graduated at twenty, I I spent some years really, um, just I would have to say busting, you know. I said yeah my the deal with my father was he would pay for college which was an incredible gift and but that was it not a penny more and so mm -hmm. I had a hundred dollars and I just played piano wherever I could but the most important thing to me was not not just saying yes I mean there's obviously you have to pay your rent you have to do all of those things but to give yourself the, your, the, to self-advocate, to be, to create a syllabus for yourself. I think sometimes we get spit out of school and especially those of us who have no connections and we wait, you're sort of waiting, right? For someone to call, no one's gonna call. So for me, it was, <clears throat> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna create my next four years of study. I'm gonna study this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna rush ticket this. 
I'm going to go to the balcony and this, I'm going to see this show 10 times with money I earned from playing in a bar. And I'm going to write about it and analyze it, that observation, that experience. I'm going to go intern there for free. That hopefully won't happen anymore. Um, that I pay by playing dance classes so that I can get that. Then I'm going to start writing. And the first step that I started writing is you, I mean, I wouldn't even use it as a ringtone now. It was just, you need to, you need to start putting things on the page. And then you get friends together in your living room and you play. And then you, and then, and then. So it's the and then part that I think eventually, if you stay with it long enough, I do think that the, the, that God puts people in your path who are meant to guide you. You have to stay in it though. And you have to stay in it. People talk about ambition as if it's a dirty thing. It is not. Ambition is the desire to move forward and to bring others with you. That's how I define it. So you bring your whole, you know, you don't do it alone. And, and you're constantly, your ears have to be like elephants. Ear, big, 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 big ears. Mouth really, really little. And learn and learn and learn. And when there is someone in the room, be in rooms that are people are smarter than you. When there's someone in the room, go home and write it down what you have learned. There are so many lessons that go, and they, uh, they obeyed us, I think, because we haven't written them down so that we can re-experience them. When you write something down, it seals it forever and you can go back to it. So that's what I mean. A lot of this kind of work is very private. The, the performative place is very public. To me, 85% of this kind of work is private. Okay, and I thought you just didn't like medicine. <laughs> I didn't look good in white. I, you know, my mom was a nurse and um, I just, I saw what happened and my dad was in private practice for a while until he couldn't do it. And I, I just saw how much it, it like, it just pained him so much when he couldn't. He, had, he said so much of medicine was guessing and it just got to him. It sort, it sort of halfway killed him. And so at the end of the day, I thought, oh, I can't do it. I'm gonna go, go the other part of the family and look for inspiration. <laughs> uh, one question in terms of, um, so there's many things that can be said about West Side Story and right this, so there's very positive things and, and some people uh, in the Puerto Rican community fight against it as well, resisting it, right? Sort of this love-hate yeah. relationship with it. Right. But one of the things that is so key, and that's why it won so many awards, is the music. Yeah. Can you sort of take us through why it was so impressive for that time, right? Because it's, it's within the context that we're talking about um, in the 1950s, 1960s. Um, so what is so musically impressive about it? Because we might, we know, we, we're sort of familiar with the songs, but why was it such a big deal, right? Number one. Um, and then number two... Right. It said that it bridged the gap between musical theater and opera. Right. And this was a question that came up in one of our previous sessions. You know, why is it considered an opera? Sorry, I would sort of want to hear your take on those two questions um, or operatic, opera, you know, that kind of thing. You know, the opera question is is uh, tricky, right, because opera in um, Italian means work. And and I think operatic for, for me um, has an epic feel to it. This is an epic story. And I think the range of what we call in music, the tessitura, the tessitura is literally the range. So when I write for opera, I can write for as, as high as the human voice can go and as low as the human voice can go, which is pretty low. And in musical theater, if opera is here, musical theater is here. You just don't have that same range. That's not true. What Bernstein did was he took the magic, and this is what I, I was trying to communicate my belief system for these young people is young people have operatic aspirations. You know, there's nothing like when a 16 year old comes home and it's and, and feels like someone has slighted them or something's happened in the cafeteria. It's like the world has ended. It's very operatic. And the dreams, the dreams of young people very high up and the lows are very low because it's a second adolescence. When our kids are two, they learn the word, no, you want to walk into the river. No, no, no. And before it was, yes, yes, yes. When people go into an adolescence, they are rebelling against, they're raging against the machine. And that is operatic. 
So what Bernstein did was this magical for me, and I know it's very complicated, but I'm not gonna address that here right now. The magic of it is the tessitura, the height of it is a reflection of the magic and the height of the dreams of these people. The low to me is also reflective of the dark, the darkness that is inspired by the Romeo and Juliet story. There is a reason why that story has been ballets and operas and, the, and this piece. It met that classical nature and Bernstein had a, an incredible gift to hear and listen what was happening in, in the music of the day. So, you know, the beer hall music, the, the jazz music, and that was unbelievably stitched together, like the use of canon in, in West Side Story. A canon is simply a, a, something that starts da 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 and it follows and it chases each other in a fugue, like it comes one after another, a beautiful technique that we see in classical music a lot. And he honored this form and mixed it together uh, so that it felt again, like a fabric of, that had been woven together by music of the day, music that he was hearing and his classical craft. Plus to meet this and to honor, he could have squished it. He could have had Maria, there's no, why is Maria a soprano? Maria is a soprano because she has that unbelievable height of finding true love for me. That's what I think. So it's, it's using it, all of those worlds and spinning them into one. And I think that idea is, was quite, for me, it was revolutionary in the day that had, had not been done in that way before. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're winding down. Um, I guess I'd like to, uh, ask if you have any last words that you want to share with us, any pearls of wisdom uh, that you'd want to share with us about your music, about this West Side Story, your role in it. Um, you know, I think, I, I really, I really do. I think the work stands for a lot of the decisions and also I appreciate the complications of it, the blessing and the curse of these, of these stories. I will say I, I don't have that lived experience at all. But as an Italian-American, I hear in stories that are abundant so that they don't reflect one way. I have seen The Sopranos and The Godfather. That's what I have seen as, as the mainstream art for Italian-Americans to see. They're brilliant and they're complicated. Il Gatto Pardo, right, those stories. But I long for abundant stories of Italian Americans that aren't just about revenge and food um, and, and family. There are more stories to be told. And I think if we encourage people to write and be additive to these stories, we will have abundance of these different, uh, of, of, of your point of view. So I guess my, my last thing would be to say, write, add, participate contribute because we have to have them. Because you got to be in the game to change it. Oh, I broke a sweat on that. You got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it to change you it. Know, yeah. Yeah. Be in it. We need it. it yeah. We really need it as, as, as human beings. We have to have those voices. Yes. We have to have them. Where can our young people or, or even older people, uh, if they have these talents, you know, do you have websites or links or, or can you tell us some of the um, organizations just briefly so that, you know, we can have an idea of where to look, where to go, where we can submit our writings and our compositions? What would you suggest? Well, there are, there are lots of, um, the the dramatist guild is a very good place to start they have student rates and the the guild itself you know as a composer we don't have a union but we have a guild and there are fellowships there the rogers the richard rogers award is an award for productions for musicals mti music theater international just announced a competition for writers um, that i think will benefit many young writers there are uh I think those kinds of grants, Jonathan Larson grant, the Freb Ed Awards, 
um, the Kleban Awards. These are substantial financial awards that can, can help. Uh, I know that the Rogers Award that I received for Violet really made a difference in that happening. And I would, the beautiful thing about this age is that you can, you can record something and share it. And it will be like in my day, I had to rent a you know, sort of crappy studio on 45th Street to get anybody to listen and record it and getting information out there. But now you can really do it and share it and it will, it will get out there. So I, I think there are many platforms in terms of getting your work heard. I think the study of it, don't be afraid to, uh, to really question how the, how the watch was made by taking the back off and looking at these pieces, question how something was done and how you would do it. If you feel like you could make it better, it probably means you can and you should because my generation is going to be replaced. We need, we need people coming up in order to make this art form transform. Uh, gracias, Maestra Tesori. Virginia, take it away. Oh, thank you so much. This has just been a delightful, delightful class. And uh, well, this is going to go online. So this is going to help a lot of our young people find their way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Uh, the invitation. I feel honored. Yeah, thank you all for coming. And on Wednesday, we have Steven Spielberg with us. So we hope you join us at the same yes. time, yes, 11 o'clock. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah. be well, take care. And thank you once again. And thank you, Maestra. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.